and welcome back to episode 6 of the Albernach Knitter. My name is Andrew and I'm coming to you from the Isle of Arran off the west coast of Scotland and it's my delight to, to work here, uh, to live here and of course to knit here as well and I'm so glad to welcome you uh, to this episode. Welcome back to those of you who are returning. I hope during this episode there's plenty to uh, entertain and to interest you. I'm really excited to be able to take you to uh, Perth on the mainland of Scotland to the Scottish Wool Producers Showcase uh, which took place just last weekend. I'm also going to take you on a walk here on the island over to the west coast of our island to the old Clacken Church as well as showing you an update on my current projects and there might even be a little bit of a demo thrown in for good measure. So great to see you. Let's get on with it. Now, the more observant among you will notice that I'm in a different place today. That's because we've got family here uh, for Easter, uh, which is lovely, but it means that upstairs spaces where I, I normally speak to you from are occupied. So here I am down in my little man cave uh, in the office. Uh, so uh, uh, apologies for looking very studious with all these books behind me. Um, but really, this is the tidiest space in the whole office. The rest of the place is an absolute tip. Uh, and apologies to in advance because I'm coming to you tired today. And when I'm tired, the right side of my face stops working. So you'll just have to put up with a drippy me today. Um, but enough of that. Um, today is my daughter Katie's birthday. And ideally, at this point, I would be showing you a finished object because I've been knitting uh, my daughter the Monday sweater by Petite Knits. Um, but it has been a very busy period, so I have no finished object to show you as far as the jumper is concerned. However, I have made some good progress. And um, as I think knitting should be a, a nice leisurely activity to rest the mind and the soul, um, I haven't tried to soldier through that much uh, with this jumper. But as you can see, we're really getting there. Um, we've got the sleeves, we've got the, the raglans and a good chunk of the body and onto the rib down at the bottom there. There's probably about five centimetres or so of rib to go. It's quite a wide rib. Um, and then of course it's back for the sleeves. So, you know, I did try. I did try. I've done so many hours of knitting on that project. You would not believe it. And because of that, I don't have anything else to show you as far as progress is concerned on any of my other knits. So it's a bit of an impoverished um, program as far as what I've been getting up to. However, I did on the weekend cast on a sock that's a partner to a red sock that I showed you before. But as I say, that's not very exciting. So I've been doing the knitting but it has been really busy and I'm really keen to get that sweater finished now. So you'll have to give me plenty of cheering on to get that sweater finished. Um, ironically, it won't be finished obviously for the birthday, which is today, but it will probably be finished for the summer and she will actually still need the jumper in the summer because it still stays quite cool here uh, on the Isle of Arran. Um, but in this last month, um, I've been overwhelmed so many times um, and mainly by you, the folks who are watching uh, the podcast, in terms of the fact that you've wanted to send some lovely gifts now, in that last little podcast I had where I was just sitting on my chair upstairs knitting and chatting away, uh, I mentioned that I was in the market for a new set of uh, interchangeable needles. Uh, I've been using uh, Knit Pro, Knit Pro uh, Zing, I think, uh, for a couple of years now, and I have a good two sets of those, and I really enjoy them. Uh, but I've started to find that the little plastic bits where they join to the metal of the needle, um, it comes away more often than I would like, and that can lead, of course, to catastrophes uh, when it comes to the middle of your knitting. Um, to lose the cord from the needle uh, when you're in a big round is just an absolute nightmare. So I've been trying to think, you know, I need to sort of upgrade my needles, hopefully to something that's a little bit better. And I asked for your recommendations and you recommended all sorts of things. But then I was absolutely blown away because there was an, a, a kind soul who got in touch and said, 
that she had some Chaigu needles just sitting doing nothing um, in her house and she said she wanted to send them to me. Well, I have to say I, I, I had some tears because she sent me these beautiful needles with all the, 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 the cables and little extra bits and pieces. Um, as well as that, she sent me three lovely uh, skeins of yarn uh, from uh, Knit Crate while Knit Crate were still going. Uh, some beautiful yarns and lots of other little bits and pieces of um, tea and pins and stitch markers. And, and, and I was just absolutely blown away by the generosity. That person did say that they wanted to remain anonymous. Um, so... I'm going to honour that, but to say a huge thank you uh, for that extraordinary kindness. And uh, I'm looking forward to casting on some new projects um, that will be able to uh, make use of those beautiful needles. I'm, I'm so overwhelmed uh, by your generosity. Um, and in addition to that, uh, one other lovely viewer sent me a gift um, having seen and heard that I was a bit of a, a kilt wearer, uh, decided that she was going to use her lovely skills to knit me some kilt socks. And that's what she did. Absolutely amazing. Now, where did you see these? Uh, kilt socks are, are a particular design. They're designed to be um, knee high uh, and often have uh, cable patterns, etc. And you'll see those beautiful cables all the way down uh, to the toes. And uh, on the back side there, uh, that again, that beautiful um, cable uh, in the the turnover, and then some beautiful cables down the back, some shaping uh, to sort of shape around the leg down to the ankles, and then the the, the lovely heel with reinforced heel, and then the the the, the flat sole of the sock, uh, and of course there's two of them, and these are absolutely beautiful. But I haven't turned. I haven't, sorry, not turned, I haven't tried them on yet because uh, my dear friend who sent them to me has sent them to me unfinished <laughs> uh, because she said she doesn't know how to do Kitchener Stitch and uh, would I like to do a little demonstration on Kitchener Stitch and finish these socks off for her benefit, for her friend's benefit and also hopefully for the benefit of you and actually for me because I'm still a beginner as far as the Kitchener Stitch goes. So we're going to do that. We're going to pause and have a little bit of a workshop on the old Kitchener Stitch and see if we can learn something for ourselves today. Right, so here we go. I'm going to try and get ready to show you the Kitchener stitch. Um, now, I have to say that I am only just learning this stitch really myself. Um, I often need some help while I'm doing it. But as they say, uh, there's nothing quite like um, learning to do something by learning how to teach other people to do it. It, it takes you to a next level in terms of your learning. So that's what I'm doing now. Uh, Katrina, who, who sent these uh, beautiful socks, uh, hand knit for me, um, sent them on waste yarn. So I've now put them on uh, to some needles and I've threaded the thread that she's left with my um, little uh, darning needle here, ready to start. Now, um, the needles are pointing to my right and the working yarn is at the back. Uh, so that's how we're going to start. And so first of all, there is some set up stitches just before we get going with the process itself. So you want to try and get your stitches, uh, in this case there's 16 stitches, um, as close to the points as possible, uh, but obviously not in a situation where you're going to lose them. And uh, so the first stage is the set up stitches. Um, the regular Kitchener stitch really has four steps to it, uh, which we'll come to in just a minute. But here we are with the setup. So what we're going to do is we're going to come to the stitches on the front needle. That's the needle uh, without the working yarn. The working yarn's at the back here. Uh, so we're going to come to the, the, the first stitch on the needle facing me. And I'm going to go in as if to purl with my yarn darning needle. And then just pull that thread through and then on the back needle that's the, the the one that had the working yarn the one that's fullest away i'm going to go in as if to knit and again pull that thread through so that's just the beginning the setup stitches uh, for the kitchener stitch now as i say there's four different steps and i'll try and talk it through as slowly as i can um, in these uh, steps that are coming in, coming up. Uh, so the first thing to do 
on the front needle is to go in and knit as if to knit and then take that stitch off the end of the needle take that stitch off the end of the needle pull a bit of yarn through but while i'm doing that i'm going to go into the next stitch on the front needle as if to purl but i'm leaving it on the needles so that's your first two steps stitches uh, knit off and then go in as if to purl then i move to the stitches on the back needle and this time i'm going to go in as if to purl and take that stitch off and then go into the next stitch on the back needle as if to knit but i'm leaving that stitch on so you've got two little steps there that join and then that's that that's that's the four steps done just to give it a little bit of a tug to tighten it up and then we're ready to go on to the next pair of needles okay so we go in to the front needle as if to knit and we take the stitch off so knit off and then we go into the next stitch on the front needle as if to purl so it's knit off purl okay and that's the front stitches work and then we go into the back stitches this time it's the opposite way around it's not knit off purl this time it's purl off take a stitch off the needles and then go in as if to knit leaving that second stitch on the needles okay pulling that through little tug just to tighten it and here we go again knit off purl purl off knit and then just give it another little tug just to tighten it make sure it's okay i hope you're seeing this all right i know that my videography camera skills aren't the one most wonderful um but there we are we've got one two three five stitches on each side <laughs> so we're not that long to go so again going in knit off on that first stitch closest to you so knit off and then go in as if to purl leaving that stitch on the needle then go into the back purl off and then going into the back as if to knit little tug that's the next set of stitches okay so we've got these last two stitches now obviously you can't do the four steps this time but you've only got the two to do to finish it off so again on the front needle the needle closest to me it's knit off just pull that through and then going into the back to purl off and again just giving it a little pull pulling that down there and then what i would normally do is just to tidy this off i would just um fix that with the tail uh, into the corner of the sock and just to give it a nice secure uh by sewing it in but as you can see um, it's given a nice finish uh, to the toe and they will be nice and secure and once they're sort of um, sewed in, sewn in, um, it will create a lovely finish uh, to Catherine's lovely, uh, lovely kilt socks. Thank you once again uh, for this beautiful gift of these beautiful socks. I'm looking forward to trying them on uh, now that the toes are finished. So there we go. That was me really badly <laughs> demonstrating how to do the Kitchener stitch on these beautiful kilt socks. Thank you so much once again. As you see, uh, the toes are now done. They're ready uh, to be worn once I've tied in the, the rest of the threads. Um, I hope that that was interesting at least. Um, but uh, honestly, the very best demonstration video 
that I have seen of the Kitchener Stitch is by Very Pink Knits. And because of my terrible bodge job, I am going to link that down in the comments if you really want to have a nice slow motion um, explanation and visual uh, how, of how to do that Kitchener Stitch really well. I really recommend that. But I just wanted to honour Catherine's kindness in sending through those socks and her request that we do Kitchener Stitch on the programme. So there we go. Now I want to take you over on that walk that I've promised you and we're going over to the west of the island to the old Clacken Church and I hope you enjoy this visit with me. Well, it's a beautiful spring day here on the Isle of Arran and I've brought you over again to the west coast and yes, here I am in another uh, cemetery, another graveyard here on the Isle of Arran um, and although I don't know of any particular members of my family that are buried here, looking at the gravestones and some of the names, definitely some of my folks in here, so more research required. But I'm really here to show you uh, the church which is just uh, above my shoulder here, uh, the old Clacken uh, Church. Now we're just about two miles away from the Macri Stone Circle and that is significant because the word Clacken means stones. But this little church here is quite a fascinating little place and I'll tell you more about it once we get over there. And so here we are inside the old Clacken Church. Now this is situated in a glen, uh, which is a, a, a Scottish word for a valley. Um, but for many thousands of years, this place has been sort of holy ground. Uh, the name Clacken indicates that long before this was a, a Christian site, um, it was very probably a center of Druidic worship. Um, the first inhabitants of the island would go to the Clacken, and Clacken is the Gaelic word for stones. So they would go to the stones uh, for worship. Uh, the Druids were famous for having their places of worship in uh, wooded groves and, and seemingly sacred places such as uh, glens uh, like this, a beautiful place, um, and where they would practice their ancient religious uh, mysteries. Um, but when the Irish monks, as I say, started to uh, Christianise much of the islands and the mainland in the west of Scotland here, uh, they would often go to the ancient places of worship and they would begin uh, their Christianization there. Now, I'm not saying that that was always a very pleasant experience. I'm sure they weren't always very nice about it, uh, but their heart was to, to share uh, the gospel, the good news as they understood it. And so they begin uh, with the people uh, where they were. Uh, one of um, Aaron's uh, saints, St. Saint Malash, um, took up residence on Holy Isle, which I've shown you over the other side of the island from here. Um, but pilgrims would often start at this side of the island in this place and they would make their way up the glen uh, just behind me that way. And so it became a sort of pilgrimage uh, route over there to the place where St. Malash had his caves and where he had his well, etc, etc, etc. A long time after that first um, settlement by the Celtic Christians, um, there was a chapel here. And uh, after the Reformation, that was then um, renovated, changed, transformed uh, to become this particular building here. But this particular building uh, was really a sort of mission station, a preaching station. The parish church had moved elsewhere, um, but because of the nature of the Isle of Arran, um, people living far and wide and flung in every corner, uh, there were various places where there would be services and where people could come and hear uh, the preaching of the gospel. Uh, so, welcome. 
welcome to Old Clacken Church. Uh, obviously not used now regularly as a place of worship, although there are the odd uh, service here at various times of the year uh, to celebrate the history of this lovely little place. This rather strange feature here is said to be a window that was designed uh, for uh, the local priest to pass out the bread and wine to those who had some form of leprosy or some form of plague or other um, is not necessarily um, in time with the building here which was much later than that sort of thing because as a preaching station this was never a place where communion was celebrated but most of these stones were probably taken uh, from earlier chapels that have been removed and destroyed and rebuilt and restored uh, to be formed in this place um, so not original to this building but an interesting piece of social history nonetheless. Now, if you have the surname of Curry, um, that is a name very closely associated with this part of the Isle of Arran. In fact, the burial ground just over the way has many uh, memorial stones to the family there. But there's a large family in this part of the island, and this was their place of worship. You may notice those uh, holes cut into the stone. That was the, uh, the holding place for the balcony, which went all the way around the church. Uh, you'll see them there on that facing too. Uh, so imagine a balcony all the way around and the pulpit uh, would have been there just by the door. As I say, this was a preaching station. It wasn't a place where you'd come for mass or communion. It was just purely and simply uh, to hear the word of God in that Reformation period. And more's the point, if you didn't manage to get here early and get a seat in the balcony, do you guess where you sat? On the floor. Now, just through from the main sanctuary is this little room here. And uh, as you can see, it's just a little add-on appendage. And this would have been the vestry. This is where the minister would have come in and uh, lit his fire. He may have had a desk in the corner and he would pre have prepared his messages and his sermons. And uh, if I just lift you above the wall, you can see the beginnings of the Glen, which would have been the pilgrimage route over to Lamlash. You were desperate to have a look up the chimney, weren't you? Well, there you are. I hope you've enjoyed this trip up to the old Clacken Church, and it's a privilege to share some more of our island history with you. Thanks for coming up. Now, tempting as it is to head over the hills back to Lamlash, I couldn't possibly do it because I brought the car and I have to take it home. What a shame. Well, welcome back. I hope that little visit over to Clacken Church was of great interest to you. And it was great to be able to show you more of the island. It's just one of the, the real joys of doing this little podcast is that I get to share this beautiful place with you. It really is a gem and there are so many other places that I can be taking you. Now, uh, as March draws to an end, I want to thank you uh, so much to all of you who have participated in the Gansey Motif Cal. The Gansey Motif Cal. I wanted to encourage people to explore the traditional Gansey motifs that are found from the British Isles on fishermen's sweaters, often depicting um, things that you would see around the harbour or representing places or people, patterns that would be incorporated into traditional garments. Uh, and I pointed out to you uh, Di Gilpin's uh, beautiful Gansey motifs, a stitch book, um, as a resource for that. And of course, I put out some Isle of Arran motifs myself, recognising that the island was not represented in some of those uh, traditional designs. Um, and thank you again to so much to everyone who bought some of those to support the channel and especially to those who have incorporated some of my motifs 
uh, into your projects. It's been absolutely wonderful uh, to see them. And in just a few moments, I'm going to show you uh, some of the entries that we've had uh, to the Gansey Motif Cal. But just to remind you that at the end of March, uh, I'll be making the random draw uh, from everyone who has used the Gansey Motif Cal hashtag on Instagram. Uh, so that you can enter. If you're not on Instagram, there's still time for you to email me uh, photographs of your finished project, product, uh, projects um, and that I will then put on Instagram so that you can be eligible uh, for the cal. Now, we have two prizes for the cal. Um, there was just one before, but there's now two. Another wonderful viewer has sent this beautiful uh, stitch uh, project bag. It's got some handles. Uh, it's denim on the bottom. Um, and a, a lovely Highland cow uh, pattern surrounded by, it looks like, white poppies. Um, really beautiful little bag. Uh, and inside there's um, lots of little um, detail with some pockets for your um, bits and bobs and all sorts um, from the ca Crafty Kiwi. Uh, so thank you so much. That's the that's first uh, prize draw. Uh, but then when I was at the Scottish Arm Producers Showcase... Uh, this weekend, Eva, who's the director of that programme, uh, came up to me and said, I've got something that I would like you to give away on your podcast. And I said, I'd be delighted to. Uh, and so what I have here um, is the After Party DK. Um, and this was the monthly um, market exclusive yarn from the Perth Festival of Yarn last year. It's 100% Super Mosh Merino, uh, 225 metres uh, per 100 grams, um, and the instruction is there to hand wash. But it's this lovely um, yellows and blues, and on the front it says uh, the Midnight Diary, um, hand dyed yarns, Midnight Diary, the hand, hand dyed yarns, and that will be the second prize uh, for the knit along. Uh, but let's look now at some of those beautiful entries uh, to the knit along. And then after that, I'm going to take you to Perth to the Scottish Wool Producers Showcase. And I'm sure that will be a lovely opportunity to look at some lovely Scottish wools. <laughs> so great to be able to bring you to the Scottish uh, Wool Producers Showcase uh, here in Perth, right in the centre of Scotland. It's been so fantastic to meet some of the yarn producers and of course some of you uh, who watch uh, the channel. It's really great to meet you. Uh, really delight to show you around today.
Hello, so we are Anfield Farm, uh, Lorianne and Andrew, husband and wife team uh, from South Fife, just outside Dunfermline. Uh, we have a goat farm and this is the lovely yarn that we make from our goat's wool. Uh, so we make a 70% mohair blend with Shetland. We get our Shetland from around the Kinross area, small holders that we know, we know how they work. We know how they treat their animals, because ethics is really important to us. We know how well we treat our goats, so we want to know how well we treat other people treat their animals. Um, we've got a range of yarns, we've got um, four ply and double knitting in the mohair blend. We have Cheer Shetland as well, which is the, uh, the fleece that we don't use for the mohair. And yeah, that's that's us. So, excellent. Nice to meet you. Lovely Thank to you. meet you. Thank you. I'm tempted to buy it all, to be honest. <laughs> I don't think my wife would be very happy though. So I'm Susan. I am the well publishing editor of the Journal of Scottish Yarns, um, and it's all about promoting Scottish textiles and telling the stories of, of the people involved in Scottish textiles. I mean, um, we've just been talking about the value of Scottish wool and how there's a view that it may not be high enough quality to do anything with, and just come to an event like this and you see what people are doing with that Scottish wool and I'm aware of and I'm sure there are many others at least 40 plus farms and crofts around Scotland who are taking local fleece their own fleeces native sheep breeds other sheep breeds and they're having that fleece made into yarn or made into products we've got Heatherby um, Black Chibi who are making it into fertilising pellets for your garden and so on and so on so it is amazing these sorts of events just go to start showing what's out there. This is issue one and I got issue two which was out at the end of November. Issue three is in the uh, preparations just now, it's coming out at the end of May. Um, it's half articles and half patterns and in issue one we started off with an overview of the history of textiles in Scotland and the native sheep breeds of Scotland of which we have nine there of the ten. The one that's missing from there is of course the Scottish black face. It didn't quite fit on the board. Yeah, so the, the patterns are generally designed using Scottish materials and they are inspired by Scotland. And we've got some of the samples here. So this one, for example, this is Aggie the Highland Cow made in Di Gilpin's Laland, double knitting. Um, this is by Sylvia Watch Cherry. And, and Sylvia, although she's based down uh, near London now, she was actually brought up in Aberdeenshire. So she's got very fond memories of growing up in Scotland. And it's just incredible the connections that people have got. Um, this one here is actually one of the crochet designs from issue two. Uh, this one uses uh, Jameson of Shetland uh, double knitting um, and it's Granny Smith, Granny Smith, oh, Granny Squares joined um, and, and crochets which is just incredible and extremely cosy, good for cold winters and hot, hot off the presses as well. Issue 3 there's going to be a focus on women, um, there's a secret that I've just shared with you. Brilliant, yeah. thank you very much.
I'm Ruth Ashton Shaw and I'm from Lowell Giff Steading. Lowell Giff is a small family run um, organic farm in Dumfries and Galloway and we are not uh, originally farmers, we're first generation farmers, we started about eight years ago but we do come from a family of knitters so we have a passion for wool which led us to get our sheep and we chose our sheep specifically for the different breeds um, and the ability to create fantastic wool. So we have Gotland and Ryland wool um, we're organic certified and obviously um, that means that we farm regeneratively and sustainably um, and that's why we find it so easy to celebrate wool because it's so magnificent, biodegradable, insulating and, and just great fun to work with. <laughs> Well, that really was a great day over in Perth uh, visiting that uh, Wool Producers Showcase. I met so many wonderful people, uh, so many dedicated people uh, to the art of producing wool and uh, I'm totally in admiration for all of them who are pursuing that business in sometimes what can be some challenging uh, conditions, challenging economic conditions. Uh, so well done to all of you. And uh, it really awakened my passion uh, to really be um, someone who can speak up for uh, wool producers, especially small businesses. And uh, I'm great. it's great to be able to use this little platform uh, to be able to highlight some of those great producers. So I hope you really enjoyed that. The highlight of the day for me was really the people. I loved the yarns and I didn't buy anything um, because I was just so totally overwhelmed by the people. It was really great to meet so many of you who were uh, viewers, as I said earlier on in that little piece. It was great to meet and uh, to chat. Um, but just a, a absolutely fantastic day. And I hope you will go and have a look at all those uh, websites. And I'll put some of the links down um, in the comments, um, not in the comments, in the description of this video. So you can go and check out those Scottish producers uh, for yourself. Um, so um, we're almost done for today, but a little bit of Gaelic to see us out. And uh, someone asked um, somewhere, I think it was on Instagram, how do we say thank you? Uh, and so I thought that would be a really good phrase to use today because I am thankful for your interest in this podcast. I'm thankful for the opportunity to go over to the uh, the showcase and to meet so many grateful people um, and just generally thankful in life uh, and thankful for the joy uh, that knitting brings. So in Gaelic, if you want to say thank you, if you're talking to one person that you know fairly well, you would say tapalet. Tapalet. Okay, so if you've got one person and you know them fairly well, you would say tapalet. Tapalet. If you're speaking to more than one person, as in a wee crowd, you would say tapalev. Tapalev. 
Um, or you would also use that if you were being polite to someone who's maybe older than you or someone who's higher ranking in society than you and all that nonsense. Tap believe. Uh, so it's tap let for someone that you know uh, or one single person and tap believe for everyone else who's above you uh, or a group of people. It's been so great to have you journey with me on another episode of this podcast. And all that remains for me to say now is Martian Leave and Drasta Agus Bianach Jagut. Take care and God bless.